Over the past 10 years, there have been a lot of incredibly popular Spider-Man projects, but arguably none are as popular as Marvel's Spider-Man for the PS4. Developed by Insomniac and later remastered for the PS5, not only is this take on the web had an excellent game in its own right, but it's truly one of my favorite Spider-Man stories told in any medium. I don't have nearly the time I used to to play video games anymore, and I generally have to use that time pretty wisely, but I cannot tell you how often I'm inspired to just throw on Spider-Man and swing around the city. It's a game that genuinely makes you feel like Spider-Man, but that wouldn't mean nearly as much if it didn't deliver such a high quality Spider-Man story. So today, let's swing through Manhattan at breakneck speeds and really dive into one of my favorite video games of all time, Marvel's Spider-Man. So I know today we're talking about a guy who wears a mask and never gets any sleep, but today's video is actually brought to you by a mask that will give you the best night's sleep possible, Manta Sleep. Manta's mission is to improve and optimize sleep to give people the energy to create their best life. And let me tell you, Manta Sleep Mask has really changed my life. I am notoriously bad at napping, but thanks to this thing, it is easier than ever for me to take a quick afternoon snooze. Recently, I've been using their weighted sleep mask and somehow it knocks me out even faster than the regular one. But I gotta say, the therapeutic bundle is the real life changer. When I have a headache or I'm a little hungover from a night out, truly nothing feels better than these cool eye cups. Manta has so many styles so you can find the perfect mask for your napping needs. If you use the link in the description of this video and use the code CELLOS10 at checkout, you can get 10% off your very own Manta sleep mask. That code again is CELLOS10. Marvel Spider-Man came just after a time where most Marvel video games were tied to film releases. Spider-Man in particular was coming off of video game adaptations of the Amazing Spider-Man series of movies. According to Marvel Games Senior Vice President Jay Ong, this didn't give developers enough time to create quality video game experiences, and so Marvel opted to change their approach. Instead of tying the game to Spider-Man Homecoming, which released just a year before this game, they tasked Insomniac with creating an original adaptation of the character. Rather than creating a game that's secondary to a major film or comic book release, they could create something that stands on its own and gets people excited about the character in a new way. While Insomniac was initially reluctant, given that this would be their first non-original property that they developed for, the possibilities of a Spider-Man game really excited the studio. And despite the weight of expectations that came with not just Spider-Man's history as a character, but his long history in video games as well, Insomniac took on the project and began researching. And they were right to be excited. We've seen through countless different pieces of media that Spider-Man wealth of characters in history can be adapted in so many different ways while still delivering high quality storytelling. This original video game adaptation is no different, and fortunately, the team at Insomniac understood what made Spider-Man and Peter Parker appealing as a character. Here's a quote from the creative director of the game, Brian Intihar. I feel like he's the most relatable of heroes. As much as I love Tony Stark, it's harder to identify with a billionaire. As much as I love Thor, it's hard to identify with a god. Peter makes mistakes, he has ups and downs in his career, his relationships relationships, his family, I think we can all relate to that. They were also quick to recognize how integral Peter's life-slash-hero balance, or imbalance, is to his character. As they put it, when Spider-Man wins, Peter Parker loses. And this is something we see time and time again throughout this entire game in major and minor plot points. I think the smartest thing that Insomniac did with this adaptation was begin the story years into Spider-Man's career, rather than rehash the origin story we've all seen countless times. This has some very clear advantages when world-building for the this version of the webhead, tapping into an existing history of character relationships as well as allowing a good number of villains from his rogues gallery to dip in and out of the story. The pacing would have been a real struggle if Peter needed to be introduced to every single villain that makes an appearance over the course of the game. Instead, they have a shared history that we can infer a ton about through their interactions and battles. In fact, Marvel Spider-Man does an unbelievable job world building and establishing Peter's history through visual storytelling in the opening shot alone. Photos Peter took of New York, photos of May and Ben as well as Peter with MJ and Harry, a police scanner, Peter and May at feast, Peter's various gadget designs for Spidey and some of the gadgets themselves, cheap takeout, a magazine with Norman Osborn on the cover, Peter's empty savings jars for vacation and a laptop, his never-ending work tinkering with his suit, Daily Bugle headlines showing that Spidey has already faced off against Scorpion, Electro, Fisk, Rhino, and Vulture, a dozen post-it notes showing how far behind he is on his chores, errands, and rent, and even a printout from Uncle Ben's funeral. And as he wakes up to the news that the cops are heading for Fisk Tower, we get a perfect little microcosm of the Spider-Man dilemma. A final notice for Peter's rent slips under the door, and he glances between the notice and the police 
police scanner app on his phone before jumping out the window and heading towards Kingpin, perfectly transitioning into the gameplay for the very first time. Truly such a great introduction to this version of the character and segue into the game, but these little details throughout not only show a fundamental understanding of what makes Spider-Man such a compelling character, but also establish exactly where he is in his life, which is helpful context even for the most devoted Spidey fans. The game also does such an amazing job storytelling through dialogue while you're traversing across New York City, which is so, so smart. Swinging around doesn't really get old, but it keeps the pacing of the game really brisk when you can learn important plot points as you're moving through the city. Even in this opening swing sequence, we get some key backstory details as Spidey is gaining info for the Fisk confrontation while he's talking to Detective Watanabe. Mind if I join in on the fun? You know how his lawyers are. This one needs to go by the book. Come on, Yuri. I've been waiting eight years for this. So we know exactly how long Peter's been operating as Spidey and that the takedown of Wilson Fisk has been a long time coming. This entire first hour not only does an incredible job rolling you through various tutorials at a great pace, but showcasing this major inciting incident that fundamentally changes the power dynamics in New York City and sets the stage for the entire game. After traversing Fisk Tower, we get our first real boss fight, taking on Fisk. This game pretty seamlessly transitions between gameplay and cutscenes, and these boss fights in particular show this off really, really well. But we also get a great showcase of the excellent performances in this game. Writing your memoirs? Don't forget the hyphen between spider and man. Get the chopper ready. I won't be long. This seems like as good a time as any to hype up Yuri Lowenthal's incredible performance as Peter and Spidey. He is truly one of the primary reasons this game's story works so well. An incredible balance of quippy confidence as Spidey and a reserved, wistful nature as Peter, all while maintaining genuine relatability. This is one of my all-time favorite iterations of the character. Obviously, the writing goes a long way here too, but Yuri sells it. Gotta go. Hey, good luck, Willie. I have a feeling you're gonna need it. I'm the one who kept order in this city! One month! In one month you wish you had me back! This is such a smart inciting incident to kick off the game. Something very firmly planted in Peter slash Spidey's history, a momentous milestone in his career, but something that completely destabilizes the hierarchy of power in the city and justifies the massive influx of problems that come our way throughout the narrative. And the game really slow rolls some great reveals too, realizing that the audience is likely very familiar with Spider-Man's wide history of characters. Early on, Peter gets a call from his boss whose identity is not not yet revealed, chastising him for being late. But after the Fisk takedown, when Peter finally arrives at work, we get this incredible shot revealing that Peter's boss is Otto Octavius. And honestly, this relationship is an absolute highlight of the game. It feels like they take the little hint of mentorship between the pair we saw in Raimi's Spider-Man 2 and expand it into a full-blown narrative arc. They've got an ongoing working history to the point where Otto isn't just Peter's boss, he's his friend. And this not only creates for a really compelling dynamic, but an incredibly tragic downfall. They even have have this great suspenseful sequence where you think Otto discovers Peter's secret. I only wish you'd told me sooner. I wanted to, but I was afraid that if word got out, my family might be in danger. Yes. Uh, I guess if you design his equipment, you're bound to be a target too. Such a funny twist, but it also helps establish a lot about this version of Otto. Peter and Otto's research is groundbreaking, but it's all meant to help people in need. This is also a concept slightly pulled from Raimi's version. Otto doesn't have any selfish motives here. He's a good man using his knowledge and abilities with responsibility, so it's no wonder that he and Peter have such a connection. He even ends up wanting to help Peter design gear for Spidey, and I love this email that he sends Pete. It really establishes their relationship in this version of of auto. The revelation of your second job as Spider-Man suit crafter, is that the right term? <clears throat> is a reminder of the good man and partner you are. No matter how hard you work, you still find time to help others. In fact, that iconic white spider suit that Insomniac Spider-Man is known for was designed by Otto in the game, which is such a cool idea in my opinion. I know the suit can be a bit controversial, and it's far from my favorite Spidey suit out there, but I love that this version of Spider-Man has such specific iconography that sets him apart visually, and I actually really like the white spider itself if I'm being honest. The sequence after Peter uses Otto's designs for the new suit is really great, with Spidey swinging through New York showing off the new drip. Coming through. Looking good, Spidey. Hello, New York. 
I really can't say enough about how well this game balances the story with introducing various gameplay elements. The opening sequence in Fisk Tower Raid teaches you all of the swinging mechanics as well as the majority of the fight mechanics. Throughout the opening hour and a half, it starts to introduce various tasks and collectibles for traversing the world map, starting with finding cell towers to establish the world map. Over the course of the game, more objectives across New York are revealed, and as long as you're mostly knocking stuff off the list as you traverse the city, like finding backpacks, taking photos of landmarks, working on research stations, it then never actually feels too overwhelming. Though later in the game, 100%ing some things can get a little tedious. But the game's narrative is so perfectly honed in on establishing its characters super economically over the first few hours of the game. Next up, they introduce us to May, who helps Martin Lee run Feast in this universe. We saw the MCU co-opt this type of occupation for May, and honestly, I don't blame them. I think giving May a little bit more of a proactive life and career not only ties into Spider-Man narratives effectively, but it feels like something May should be doing after Ben's death, inspired to take responsibility and do what she can to help, like Ben. This first scene also establishes Peter and May's dynamic, as Peter tries to distract her from her surprise party reveal, leading to May simply being concerned for Pete's well-being. But Peter's words about May go so far to tell us what she's all about. What is it? Come on, you can tell me. These past few years, you helping me through college and working here, and sacrificing so much and asking for nothing. I just wish there were more people like you in the world. May also lets slip that she's disappointed that Pete and MJ aren't together anymore, and I think that leaving Pete's love life in this precarious position was such a smart move for the game, establishing that Pete and MJ have significant history with seemingly unfinished business. And personally, I really love the way they drop MJ into the story for the first time. Don't move! Buddy, if I had a nickel for every don't move... Hey, Pete. So they immediately establish that Pete has already revealed his secret identity to MJ in this world. They've got a lot of history and some great chemistry. Pete trying to protect MJ, but MJ being stubborn and trying to keep chasing down the lead. That's good stuff. I like it. This version of MJ is actually a great example of something I really respect about this game. There are aspects of this world and these characters in the game that are not my personal favorite choices for a Spider-Man narrative, but I think they mostly made the exact right choices for the world and these characters in a video game. In this case, I understand the people who are not crazy about the MJ investigative reporter angle. My personal taste is that I actually really like MJ as a model slash actress or party girl. This can feel a little bit too Lois Lane, you know? However, MJ as an investigative reporter is a perfect way to naturally tire into the ongoing narrative and gameplay. With MJ doing parallel investigations to Peter and then relaying that information to Pete, you're able to tie her into the story really effectively. It's really economic storytelling, directly tying Pete and MJ's reconnection and reconciliation with any and all ongoing story points, which is really helpful in such a robust narrative. There are other aspects of this game that I feel similarly about. I think in general, things are a bit more militarized than I would normally care for in my Spider-Man media, just countless encounters with gangs and even armies and armor-clad sentries later. However, this again makes sense for a video game. Consistent enemy encounters and increasingly dangerous scenarios help escalate the stakes in a video game context. It feels like almost every choice is justified, even if it isn't my personal general preference for a Spider-Man story. Though, I do understand why people aren't huge fans of the MJ missions themselves. They can be a bit tedious, and obviously just being a person after being Spider-Man is a severe de-escalation. But I do personally enjoy the info about her and Pete's history that you can glean if you're willing to dig into the details during the missions. In this first one, if you go look at every piece of art in the auction house, you'll usually get a revealing monologue from MJ. This cut Peter open like a pork sausage with this the first time they fought. Pete got away, collapsed in my yard half dead, and I had to steal my dad's car to drive him to the ER. The first of many Nurse MJ moments. Too many. It's a cool way to get a little insight into the character's history and relationship, and even provides context for why their romantic relationship maybe hasn't worked out. It's not necessary for the ongoing narrative, but if you want to dig a little deeper, the option is there. I also like how this little chance encounter basically opens the door for Peter and MJ to reconnect. Mix. Like the last six months never happened? Pete and MJ have such great chemistry in this world too, and they do such a great job showcasing their connection and care for each other while further establishing some of the most important aspects of this narrative. You know Oscorp would hire you in a heartbeat, right? One phone call to hair- Sure, but Dr. Octavius' work will help millions. I'm, I'm right where I want to be, right where I should be. 
Almost sounds like it's more important than your other job. I've never heard you talk like that before. Man, that's great stuff. This entire scene has so much subtext. I love watching them dance around the serious discussion they should be having about their relationship. Quality spidey relationship drama right there. Love seeing you two together again. You always were my favorites. The narrative overall escalates really naturally. They introduce new threats like the demon gang and throw in quick detours with classic villains like the shocker chase down. It's all paced really well, progressing the narrative without feeling like it's focusing on any one thing for too long. And then, as they achieve their biggest success scientifically, Otto and Peter's hopes are dashed entirely. Norman Osborn revokes their grant and takes their research and equipment. This scene does a great job revealing key pieces of info about characters and hinting at their histories. Mr. Osborn. Oh, please. How long have we known each other? It's Mr. Mayor. <laughs> it's Norman. Norman! Norman, what do you think you're doing? Not only does this establish that Norman is the mayor, but it's basically Norman using his power to steal Otto's research for his own gain. The first step in Otto's tragic and inevitable downfall. I love that this path in the story stems from a place of desperation. A man who is trying so hard to do good, but is being stopped by more powerful, selfish forces. It's sort of a perfect Spider-Man narrative. I also like that this story establishes Norman and Otto before either of them have become Doc Ock or Green Goblin. That's a little unusual for this deep in Spider-Man man's career, but it saves his most iconic villains for these stories. And after the sequence without the grant, Otto can't afford to pay Peter anymore. Another example of how this game is always balancing wins and losses between Peter and Spidey. Another thing I love about this game is that since this is later in Peter's career, they gradually start establishing a little bit of Miles Morales narrative in this very first game. First introducing his dad, Jeff Davis. Officer Davis, call me Jeff. And you are? Uh, <laughs> just messing with you. My son's a big fan. I think introducing Jeff first was a smart move. You get to do a pretty cool investigative mission with him before things escalate into a high-speed chase, and as Spidey is stopping a gas truck from falling on the train tracks, Jeff saves his life not once, but twice. And this works great within the narrative because Peter feels he owes a bit of a debt to Jeff, and also sees that Jeff sort of carries that same great responsibility mantra that he does, which is especially apparent in his tragic death scene as the demon gang attacks the mayoral rally where Jeff is being honored. In this universe, Miles is a big Spidey fanatic, and his introductory shot is perfect, grabbing a quick video of Spider-Man after he stops a helicopter from crashing into the street below. This is shortly before that aforementioned rally. Miles is one of three playable characters in the game, though he just has a couple short missions, but the first is without a doubt the most brutal. After the attack on the rally, he saves his mom and goes in deeper to find his dad. The imagery here is actually wildly violent, and though there isn't much blood, it did make me question if this game could have ever been rated M. Executions, dead bodies, it's pretty gnarly. It's really interesting though, this game actually came out just a few months before Into the Spider-Verse, and these were probably the two highest profile adaptations of Miles as a character so far, and both stories actually decided to give Miles his own Uncle Ben moment, a tragic origin point. Obviously Into the Spider-Verse opted to use Uncle Aaron for their narrative, and these Insomniac games go with his father, Jeff, and I think these instincts for both adaptations were absolutely spot on, an incredibly smart decision narratively to tie Miles into the larger Spider-Man myth in the comics, Miles doesn't really have one of these Uncle Ben moments before or around the time he becomes Spider-Man. His father ends up bailing on him after learning that he becomes Spider-Man, and his uncle actually just tries to use his powers for his own personal gain, which are also tragic in their own ways. Later in the comics, his mother does get killed by Venom, which is both devastating and also has me terrified for Rio in the upcoming Spider-Man 2, but they didn't really give him a formal parallel to the death of Uncle Ben, at least in the comic books. I just think it's really interesting that both of these incredible Spider-Man adaptations that were developed at the same time both had the inclination to bolster Miles' origin in this way. Both improvements to his comic book origins, in my opinion. But the thing that I actually really love about the Insomniac adaptation of Miles is the fact that his origin is tied to an active Spider-Man. I know most other adaptations have him taking over after Peter's death, but I love Peter and Spidey acting as an active mentor to Miles. And it even begins in this game before Miles is bit by the spider. I know you don't know me. But I just wanted to say, I know what you're going through. 
I think some of this ties back to Peter feeling like he owes a debt to Jeff for saving his life. Also, he sees a little bit of himself in Miles, but they do a great job showing Peter's attempts to connect with Miles without sacrificing that grieving period for Miles himself. There's a really heart-wrenching scene after Miles starts to help out at Feast, where he helps fix an old TV, only for it to reveal a news report about his father is playing at that very moment. Here he is trying to do something good for the world to help his healing, and he's confronted with his pain. En route to his first volunteer day, Miles is mugged and saved by Spidey. It's fun to see Miles Miles just geek out about meeting him, but even cooler is what happens after Spidey tries to give him advice. It's easy for you to say, I, sorry, I just can't do what you do. Alright, put him up. Seriously. Yeah, come on. I genuinely love this sequence. Peter knowing that Miles lost his father figure, actively recognizing what it would mean to him to get a personal fighting lesson from his hero, and it really starts to introduce that mentor role he takes on, further seen in the Miles Morales game. And I love the way this escalates too. Later in the game, Spidey and MJ save Miles and May from a burning feast building, and it culminates in Peter realizing he can't really do everything alone. Without MJ, May and Miles might not have made it out of the fire, and without Miles and MJ, Peter might not have made it out of the fire. And so, he, Miles, and MJ sort of form this trio at this point. Ms. Watson and I were just talking strategy. Strategy? That's right. The city is in danger. It needs our help. All of our help. All right, well, call the play, coach. Though this game doesn't technically contain Peter's Spider-Man origin story, it does have a Spider-Man origin, that of course being Miles. And I think this was such a smart move. Insomniac's writing team was both thinking ahead and building out their own Spideyverse in a unique way. I especially love the first post credit scene for a few reasons. Miles trusts Peter enough to reveal his newfound Spidey powers to him. He doesn't know Peter is Spider-Man yet, but through their forming friendship and mentorship at Feast, he trusts Peter enough for him to be the one he asks for advice about this. And I love even more that that Peter immediately reveals to him that he is Spider-Man as well. The character relationships are just really well handled in these games. Their bonds form and escalate really naturally, and the characters all have such great chemistry. You have his number. Are you Spider-Man's girlfriend? Speaking of which, the Peter and MJ reconciliation is another narrative highlight. I really appreciate how much character and relationship development the game is able to pack in, largely because it doesn't all have to be done via cutscenes. Peter and MJ's serendipitous meeting early on in the game leads to them working together and reconnecting throughout the rest of the game, and there's a great little arc in regards to how Peter treats MJ. Reading between the lines, it seems like once Peter revealed his identity to MJ, he became a bit overbearing, out of fear that something might happen to her. A very Spider-Man-like fear to have, a great hiccup to establish in their relationship because it's an understandable issue for them to work through. When Pete first runs into MJ early in the game, he's horrified that she put herself in danger, and of course with this new investigative career, MJ continues to do this, but without telling Peter. But you can tell that MJ MJ wants Peter to be a part of all of this. What if we teamed up? What, what, you want to be my sidekick? No, not a sidekick. A partner. This fully comes to a head at the Sable base when MJ nearly gets the information she needs before Peter busts in to try and protect her and totally blows it. Definitely not a Sable guy. Sorry, Charlie. Okay, time to Wait, go. No, he knows something. <laughs> I think from here they do a great job showing Peter start to accept that MJ is able to make her own decisions. The next MJ mission takes place at Grand Central Station. MJ and a group of people are held hostage. In this one, you actively work with Peter, helping direct who he should web up to help her sneak around and free everybody. Between this and MJ's help saving Miles and May at the Burning Feast building, Peter really starts to turn a corner on how he views their relationship. For the final MJ mission, MJ fully tells Peter ahead of time that she's going to sneak into Norman's penthouse instead of keeping it a secret. Peter even acts as her support, rather than vice versa, keeping an eye on the building and aiding in her daring escape. You are crazy. You're amazing. While the game itself is so much fun, jam-packed with action, customizability, and wildly inventive sequences, the heart is absolutely the character relationships. But let's actually take a moment to geek out about that gameplay. It's cliche to say, but the game literally makes you feel like Spider-Man. Not just through the amazing mechanics allowing you to swing through all of Manhattan, but through the almost overwhelming number of things that require your attention. While it can be a lot to take in as a player, I think this is intentional to make you feel like Peter Parker. To make you feel like 
like there are so many things that you need to try and fix that you couldn't possibly balance all of them alongside any semblance of a social life. It's just such an incredible illustration of the Spider-Man dilemma, the struggle to live up to your great responsibility and live a fulfilling life of your own. Some of the action sequences in this game, particularly the one where Spidey has to stop a crane from falling down into the city, are so incredible to experience. Yeah, action commands themselves aren't particularly demanding, but I don't actually care when it's showcasing such gorgeously cinematic sequences. The game seamlessly blends these with the ongoing gameplay and cutscenes. Everything just flows so perfectly. I know a lot of people prefer a Spider-Man that isn't overly reliant on gadgets, but in the context of a video game and a Peter Parker that's been at it for eight years, I think the various tools in your arsenal make for some incredibly fun combat. Not to mention the abilities and customization options. The massive variety of suit options from Spidey's history are so much fun. And even though I'd love to see the character of Ben Riley properly introduced in these games in some capacity, my first playthrough was basically done entirely in the Scarlet Spider outfit, an all-time fave. And don't even get me started on the score. I have no idea how they've managed to create so many unique Spider-Man themes and still managed to win me over time and time again. This has become one of my go-to scores to listen to while I read Spider-Man comics, though. It's so good. Like I said, obviously all of this added together creates for one absolutely incredible package, but that package would not be anything if the story and character relationships weren't successful. We've already talked about how great a job they do setting up Peter and Octavius' relationship, and we'll talk later about how all that culminates in an absolutely stunning finale. But just as important is Otto's tragic fall into villainy. Mostly through voicemails and calls that Otto leaves Peter, we hear how Otto's plans have shifted from simple prosthetics to something new, something even better and more versatile than the human arm, which of course leads to the incredible reveal of the Ock arms for the very first time. Alongside the devastating reveal that Otto has a neurological disorder that is slowly destroying his motor functions, making the Ock arms his potential saving grace. These are the things that make Insomniac's Doc Ock so perfectly executed. Of course we all know Octavius becomes Dr. Octopus, every Spider-Man fan on Earth knows this, but what's brilliant about this story is that they invest you in Octavius's struggles, they invest you in his relationship to Peter, so that when the turn finally comes, you don't want it to happen. We're all safer now than we have ever been. Liar! You have no idea what you're in for. And they somehow manage to continually escalate this into even more devastating territory. But we'll get to the end game soon enough. Ock isn't the only compelling villain either. The character work they do with Martin Lee, aka Mr. Negative, is really impressive. Mr. Negative is definitely the newest Spider-Man villain utilized in the game, only first being introduced in the comics in 2007. I think for a lot of people, it can be hard to be invested in the less iconic Spidey villains when they're utilized, but this is absolutely not the case here. Again, primarily because of how this story ties so deeply into the other characters. Not only is Martin Lee Aunt May's boss at Feast, adding a personal connection for Peter, but his tragic backstory ties him to both Otto and Norman Osborn, with the devastating reveal that their experiments on Devil's Breath gave Lee his abilities, and also led to those abilities killing his parents. It's another beautiful example of Insomniac's character-first approach. It's why this game works so well. Even introducing a world where Peter has been Spider-Man for years, they don't skip steps when introducing the audience to these versions of the characters. Even the filler villains in this game are utilized really well. Electro, Vulture, Rhino, and Scorpion are all introduced at a major turning point in the game, and through dialogue and gameplay we understand exactly how much history they have with Spidey, and how dangerous they are. This entire action sequence at the raft is incredible, just beautifully cinematic while also making the player feel the sense of urgency. We don't need to dive deep into their backstories, because their history with Spider-Man, alongside the dire nature of their escape, add all of the stakes to the story that we need. Need, especially with the revelation that all of them, along with Martin Lee, are now being directed by Octavius. This game does something I didn't realize was possible. It makes the formation of the Sinister Six terrifying, despite doing it within one single narrative. Though we had never met these versions of four of the villains before the Raft escape event, the formation itself is wildly compelling, especially with the Ock leadership reveal. The way Octavius's direction helps the group reach their full potential is probably my favorite way to portray the Sinister Six. Very reminiscent of how spectacular Spider-Man handled it. The way the narrative utilizes Silver Sable was also pretty brilliant, making her an antagonist to Spider-Man, but not a full-blown villain, with Norman hiring her and her agents as a personal army in the wake of all of the terrorist attacks on the city. Even the side villains add so much to this universe. There is an entire side mission with Tombstone that isn't even required to beat the game, but having all of these villains operating simultaneously make the world feel more lived in. The way the demons use a street-level villain like Shocker also adds to this feeling. They 
They even give other characters a presence in the gameplay without actually introducing them into the ongoing narrative. Jameson is a great example, who's retired from the Daily Bugle and now runs the podcast that Spidey listens to constantly. As you're swinging across the city, you're regularly treated to a dose of menace accusations. Such a smart way to incorporate his presence into this version of New York without adding him to the narrative or making you read newspaper headlines. Black Cat is incorporated similarly. There's a side mission where she leads you on a wild goose chase across the city to track down these cat dolls. Been thinking about you a lot lately. We were good together, weren't we? Maybe it's time to reignite the flame. And once you find all these locations, you learn that she played Spidey and used the dolls to break her gear out from the police precinct, which is so perfectly Felicia. I've said it before, but it's just such economic storytelling. There's an entire Black Cat subplot that establishes so much about her history with Spidey without showing her in a single cutscene, at least until the DLC. But probably my favorite example of one of these characters that has a presence without being in the actual narrative is Harry Osborn. You hear Harry V of voice recordings left for Peter on his Oscorp research stations across the city, and most of them lead to Peter adding insightful commentary about their friendship in this universe. There are even some phone calls with MJ reminiscing about the old days when it was just the three of them, before Harry left for his mysterious Europe trip. And as a player, it's pretty easy to get the sense that there's more going on with Harry's absence, but that doesn't make the reveal for the characters any less impactful. During a mission to Norman's penthouse, MJ discovers that Harry isn't in Europe. He's been undergoing treatment for a terminal illness, the same one that killed his mother. I honestly teared up reading Harry's journal entry where he writes a heartfelt apology to Pete and MJ for not telling them sooner. But what's even more brilliant is that this devastating reveal for MJ and Peter also ties directly into the core narrative here. Norman's devil breath experiments started as his attempts to save his wife and continued into his attempts to save his son. Which leads us to maybe the most underrated villain in the game, Norman Osborn himself. In fact, everything in this game leads back to Norman Osborn. And even though he's a selfish asshole, they even managed to give him empathetic motivations through his relationships. He lost his wife and is doing everything he can to try and save his son at everyone else's expense. Devil's Breath was his early attempts at this and it did three major things. One, it gave Martin Lee his tragic backstory and motivations to get revenge on Osborne. Two, it created Devil's Breath itself, which causes a major citywide pandemic and quarantine in this narrative. And three, it caused Otto to split from Norman and led to his eventual motivations for revenge. Everything leads back to Norman Osborn. In fact, this seems to be vitally important moving forward as well. As we see in the post credit scene, Norman seems to be using a symbiote to try and keep Harry alive. By now, we all know that Harry and Venom are both major players in the upcoming Spider-Man 2, once again tying potentially devastating events directly back to Norman. I expect that by the time Spider-Man 3 rolls around, we'll probably be looking at a Green Goblin narrative as the ultimate villain of the trilogy. The truth is... You were only ever worth a damn when you worked for me. The truth is, you could never accept that I'm better than you. You're a failure, Otto, and you always will be. And what better transition to the villain of this game, Doc Ock. The final battle against Octavius is perfectly executed. Otto is atop Oscorp Tower with Norman and the anti-serum that can heal everyone infected with Devil's Breath, including Aunt May. Peter goes in thinking that he can appeal to the half of Otto that he looked up to, the hero that inspired him. Otto, you've worked your whole life to help people. The battle itself is intense, but nothing hits as hard as the reveal that Otto actually did know that Peter was Spider-Man. Just a devastating betrayal. I've worshipped you, your mind, your conscience, wanting to help others the way you never gave up. But Otto's speech here is one of the most ingenious pieces of writing I've ever seen in any Spider-Man media. The entire reason that Peter was so drawn to Otto as a mentor is because he embodied with great power comes great responsibility. But here in this final moment they share together, we see how Otto has taken that mantra too far. That he can use that very same code as an excuse to do awful things. That's because men like us have a duty, a responsibility to use our talents in the service of others. Even if they don't appreciate it, we have to do what's best for those beneath us, whether they understand it or not. No, you're wrong! 
You are everything I wanted to be! God, I genuinely cannot say enough about how immaculately crafted this relationship is. Built up so beautifully, just so it can come crashing down in the most devastating way. Something that so perfectly embodies the tragedies of Peter's life. Through an iconic legacy character with an amazing new twist on the relationship. Top tier stuff. And it isn't even the most emotional scene in the story. Peter is faced with the ultimate test of his moral fortitude. Use the anti-serum to save May, or lose her while they replicate it so they can save everybody else. And I am so proud of you. And Ben would be too. All the people you've saved. I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. Devastating doesn't even begin to describe May's death in this game. Over the course of this story, Peter lost his job, his apartment, and his most important role models. His literal mother figure. Some of the most important people in his entire life. It's a game that perfectly illustrates the sacrifices that come with being Spider-Man and with doing the right thing. And despite these devastating losses, Peter still moves forward. Despite the non-stop heartbreak, he also gains so much. He saved potentially millions of people from Devil's Breath. He formed incredibly important new friendships and relationships, like with Miles, and even took on a mentor role himself. And of course, he reconnected with Mary Jane, the love of his life. There are so few stories that perfectly encapsulate the Spider-Man experience better than Insomniac Spider-Man, and personally, I cannot wait to see what's coming next. Hey, thanks for watching this video on Insomniac's Spider-Man game. If you liked it, stay tuned. I'll be covering the Miles Morales game ASAP and Spider-Man 2 very shortly after that releases, so look forward to those. If you want more now, make sure to check out all my other Spider-Man series retrospectives. I'm really proud of those videos. Thanks for swinging by, and I'll catch you next time. Peace. I stay mellow watching Johnny two cellos. He talks cartoons, he's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite series. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny Two Chells, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move.